All right, good morning. Good morning, I think we're gonna get started. So I'm pleased to introduce uh, our lock visiting professor, uh, Dr. Dick Kovacs. Um, Dr. Kovacs is the current vice president of the American College of Cardiology, uh, and in the spring he'll become the president of the ACC. Uh, Dr. Kovacs is currently the QE and Sally Russell Professor of Cardiology at Indiana University School of Medicine, and also the Cardiology Service Line Director uh, at IU Health Physicians. Uh, Dr. Kovacs uh, went to college at University of Chicago Medical School uh, at University of Cincinnati and since then has spent his rest of his career at Indiana University um, School of Medicine. Uh, in the ACC he has served many prominent roles as a chair of the Board of Governors, a member of the Board of Trustees. Uh, in addition he's been involved in many different activities uh, and committees within the uh, ACC including the chair of the Science and Quality Committee and co-chair of the Sports and Exercise Cardiology Council. Uh, in addition he's been a member of the AHA ACC Task Force on Practice Guidelines. Uh, more importantly, he has a close connection to University of Washington. Uh, his daughter actually got her PhD here in epidemiology. And he actually got to participate, uh, actually didn't participate, he was a, an observer for her thesis defense here a few years ago, and now she just recently moved to the CDC. So I would like to introduce Dr. Dick Kovacs uh, from Univer uh, Indiana University. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm really happy to be here, and uh, I want to acknowledge the uh, and the the support of the Division of Cardiology and the uh, Locke uh, family and their trust uh, that uh, funds this grand round. So that was really special to be uh, named. Um, I want to talk a little bit about something that people don't talk about a lot, um, but I think is is very important and um, has driven a, a, a lot of what I've done in my career, and that's the prevention of things uh, that shouldn't happen. And uh, if you wonder why the, it is safety first, um, the, the act of Congress that created the Food and Drug Administration uh, specifies that, that new therapies should first be safe and then effective. So that's the origin of that quote, uh, safety first, and, and each of us has a role in protecting our patients from harm. Uh, so that's, uh, that's uh, why that title is the way it is. I, I have no relevant disclosures. Um, Eugene said that I, I, I have one minor correction to my, to my resume and that I, in full disclosure, uh, for about five years of my career, I actually worked at Eli Lilly in drug safety. Um, so I was a full time on the dark side uh, until uh, 2004 when I came, when I was recruited back by Doug Zipes to come back to the faculty. Um, so uh, I do have that perspective. I, I hope that as you come out of this, we always have learning objectives. And, and first and foremost, I hope that number one is that you can report an adverse event if you see it. If you see something, say something is the word on the street now. And uh, how many have filed a MedWatch report? Okay, we got room for improvement. <laughs> I think increasingly we have also systems to ensure drug and device safety and I'm going to show you how this ought to work in the modern era. And I think also when we leave this room we can all advocate for safety for drugs and devices for our patients. Just last year, um, a plane crashed in southern Indiana, uh, and on board was a, a, a physician by the name of Lou Cantalina, his daughter and a friend of the family. And uh, Lou Cantalina uh, is probably not known to you, but he is uh, probably seminal in, in the development of, of safe medications, having been the senior author on this paper. Uh, this was the first description of, of Torsade de Plante due to uh, a drug that was not intended for cardiovascular use. This is terfenidine. Uh, the younger people in the room will not recognize this drug, but you use lots of fexofenidine, uh, which is the metabolite of this drug, and was the first non-sedating antihistamine. And when used in combination with, uh, with metabolic inhibitors of terfenidine, such as erythromycin or ketoconazole, it was fatal. And after the initiation of this drug in the United States, there became reports of primarily young women. So torsad, drug-induced torsad is, is preferentially affects women over men. It's one of those unknown uh, uh, women's health issues. 
but uh, the terfenidine uh, uh, fatalities began to accumulate and uh, Lou uh, through the kind of deductive reasoning that uh, some of us are very capable of and he was a master at this uh, dissected that this was a, a, a drug induced effect and so over the next roughly 20 years, uh, drug-induced torsade de Poin has become a model system for how we should protect our patients from the adverse and unexpected effects of drugs. But it's grand rounds, so we'll, we'll, we'll give a case. So here, here's a um, uh, sort of standard, uh, you know, we see this every day, 85-year-old woman, she's got a respiratory infection, uh, she's given some antibiotics, and uh, of course she's put on telemetry, but not for any particular reason. <laughs> Troponins were negative. Um, so, um, but she got some moxifloxacin. And um, then telemetry reported this arrhythmia, which now you'll recognize as the typical polymorphic tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia with twisting on the points that is a classic for uh, torsade de Poin. So let me digress from that case because this, my point to you is that this happens. And you may think that this happens automatically, but this paper in Nature Medicine several years ago, uh, some of these authors, uh, Norm Stockbridge is at the FDA, um, talked about a really a new branch of science, translational regulatory science, a branch that would, that would bridge our understanding from the basic research laboratories into the clinic uh, to understand often the untoward effects of, ther of new therapies. And uh, they really didn't coin this term, but it was coined by Ray Woosley. Some of you may know the name. Ray, Ray is an electrophysiologist at the University of Arizona. And he set this timeline for how we discovered things in drug safety, you know, basic toxicology, things like the thalidomide story. Here's Lou Cantalina's story about ter terfenidine in the 1990s. But then he proposed, he and others have proposed this notion that perhaps we should be much more scientific about our approach to drug and device safety. And I'm going to try to convince you that that may be a good idea. In 2018, we have four major areas of opportunity. Um, and I'm going to use drug-induced torsade as a model system for perhaps how this should happen. I'm going to challenge us with the burgeoning field of cardio-oncology that it presents an enormous new challenge with the number and diversity of drugs that are being used for oncology and the cardiotoxicities and potential cardiotoxicities of those agents. It, th this, is a, uh, this is a lifetime of work for many in order to s sort this out. Diabetes drugs uh, represents an interesting uh, area where the regulatory re requirements have, uh, have dri driven change. The fact that we are now seeing cardiovascular outcomes trials in every new diabetes agents was not an accident, but rather a regulatory requirement. And for those of us who implant cardiac devices, stents and defibrillators, perhaps we should become more modern in our approach to safety surveillance rather than the paper and pencil uh, that we have right now. So we have enormous opportunity for advancement. After Lou Cantalina described those young women who died after exposure to terfenidine and other stuff, um, there was a, a, a long effort at trying to prevent this. Around that time there were a number of other drugs, probably around 20 or 25 drugs withdrawn from the market because of proarrhythmic effects, resulting in, in, in this document that probably nobody in this room has read, but is probably the best scientific discussion of the field. Um, this is a guidance for industry um, and is, is 
is this is actually published by, by FDA, but the designation E14, this is an internationally harmonized approach to cardiovascular safety. A thing called the ICH, or the International Conference on Harmonization, ensures that the approach to drug safety, whether it's in the United States, Canada, Europe, Oceania, or Asia, is a consistent approach. And this is scientifically agreed upon around the world. So this has been, this was a major step forward and has led to the fact that although 20 or 25 drugs were removed from the marketplace prior to 2000, none have been removed since. The approach though is based on good clinical science, good clinical science Leads, leads from good clinical observations like Lou Cantalina's. And Torsad, I don't know how many of you have seen, or even the electrophysiolo my electrophysiology partners at, at IU, have looked at the original description of Torsad. Um, this is the original description from Dessartan, Philippe Kumel, and others in France, describing this polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. I, I apologize that this is a photocopy of an article, but this is 1972, and uh, PowerPoint didn't exist. The uh, twisting on the points was described nicely in, Fran in French. The marks on here are the authors, not mine. But uh, this was the ostensibly the first description of torsade. Now for the young people in the room, my mentors taught me that uh, in medicine, uh, nothing is new. Everything has been described before. And indeed with torsade, 40 years prior, there was this description in, the, in a non-med-lined or PubMed journal, the, the New York uh, Academy of, Sci of Medicine journal, which describes something called transient ventricular fibrillation in a patient with complete heart block who was exposed to quinidine. And you'll see that the recordings here in 1932, as opposed to 1972, show a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia spontaneously terminating. If you look carefully at the records, you'll also see macroscopic T-wave alternands described by uh, Dessartan. So uh, everything new is actually old. So for those of you who don't think in this way, remember that this is based on sound science. So the clinical observation that you can have this arrhythmia, this arrhythmia may be due to drugs. And then why does this happen? This has been well worked out. Uh, for, the, for the younger folks, remember that the, that the electrocardiogram is a representation of the sum total of the electrical activity of the heart. And largely, we focused on this repolarizing current called HERG, or the human ether agogo related gene current which is preferentially affected by uh, drugs. And Sanguinetti and others uh, worked this out years and years ago. This is an old paper from 2001. I hate to show old things unless they're historical, but really it, it, this, this mechanism for the majority of, of uh, QT prolonging and torsadogenic drugs is, is, uh, still holds. The, these drugs bind to the Herg channel. They, in, they limit the amount of repolarization reserve. They prolong the QT and they can produce arrhythmia. But if there are any EP fellows in the room, you might be tested on this because this is not the only mechanism for torsade or for uh, QT prolongation. Here's two examples of other things. Pentamidine actually inhibits the maturation of the Herg channel. And arsenic trioxide, which your, your cancer doctors know very well, um, it inhibits the translocation of the channel to the surface of the cell membrane. So there are differences. And these are clinically important because one is an immediate effect, but these are later effects after exposure. <laughs> so the science goes on. And drugs like was given to our case, moxifloxacin, is a reliable and reproducible uh, inhibitor of the Herd channel and can be readily measured on the surface electrocardiogram if it's done right. This is a plot here of moxifloxacin, and these are actually plasma concentrations of moxifloxacin plotted against the placebo, uh, uh, the baseline adjusted placebo subtracted QTCF. You'll notice this is a Fredericia uh, uh, correction factor. I'm not going to have time to talk about correction factors this morning, uh, but this is not the correction factor that you use. 
Um, and you can see that as uh, over a range of plasma concentrations, which are rapidly uh, uh, attained in two to four hours after a dose of moxifloxacin, the effect on electrophysiology is obvious. It is so obvious that in drug trials to test new drugs for QT prolongation, moxifloxacin is used as the positive control. It reliably and reproducibly, and in most cases safely, uh, increases QT by about six to eight milliseconds, about two to four hours after dosing, a single oral dose. <coughs> But my colleagues say uh, two things to me. They say this is all nonsense, this doesn't really exist, it doesn't have clinical relevance, uh, but this paper in New England Journal of Medicine in 2012 would argue that at least from an epidemiologic standpoint that this may be important for our patients and that if you look at cardiovascular death or death from any cause by simply patients filling a prescription for azithromycin and propensity match for patients who received amoxicillin, that there is a, a Kaplan-Meier curve that doesn't look favorable in terms of the, just simply filling a prescription for an antibiotic known to prolong QT. Well, how many patients does this really affect? Well, it depends on how hard you look. So here, from the same paper, uh, the, these are decile scores of cardiovascular risk. And remember that female sex is a risk, along with electrolyte abnormalities, heart failure, structural heart disease, and a lot of other things. But in the highest decile of risk, if one writes one million prescriptions for azithromycin for a five-day course, one will see roughly a doubling to tripling of death. So depending on your bet, you may see excess deaths in the hundreds when one is managing populations with a drug that has perhaps a safer, safer alternative. So for those of you who are population health managers, this may be a significant consideration. The second thing my, my colleagues will tell me is that, you know, you don't really see this, um, but again, it's how hard you look. This is a different way of looking at this. This is a paper from Europace. This is an active surveillance system that was put in place in two cities in Germany to look at symptomatic torsad, adjudicated cases of torsad. And the epidemiology is this. If you use pa passive surveillance, if you just use our spontaneous reporting system such as we have in this country, one might see 0.26 per million patient years of exposure, uh, of exposure, but in active surveillance, an order of magnitude greater effect on patient outcomes, meaningful adjudicated patient outcomes. The science also has to be based on precision, and I mentioned the, that moxifloxacin increases QT by six to eight milliseconds reliably and reproducibly if it is measured right. So do we measure this right? Um, it is very difficult. This, this quote is not mine. It's hard to measure QT. It's hard to correct it for heart rate. Eugene Lepeshkin and Boris Sarawitz said this in 1952, and this continues today, and I hope I can convince you that maybe this is something that we should do better. So most of us rely on automated measurements of QT for our clinical decision making. If you have an electrocardiogram that looks like this, your automated measurement of QT is very nice. But let's take this electrocardiogram. And you can't see it, but so I blew it up up here, but the corrected QT by, this is a GE Marquette Muse, I don't know what your system is in the hospital, it's probably this or, or one other. Um, but this said it, the QTC is 437 milliseconds, not any cause for alarm. Now, do we agree that that QT is 437 milliseconds? And how many of us dig back into the measurements that are created in Muse this is, a, this is a thing, I, I'm not going to go into detail, but these are the median complexes generated in Muse that tell you what your measurements are. And you can see that this sort of shotgun blast or hand grenade approach to measuring the QT automatically may be off by, by uh, you know, 
100 milliseconds or more. So are we measuring this correctly when we are attempting to, cor to protect our patients? I was very happy to see that now we're starting to go back to the back to the future uh, and in this recent paper uh, by Chang and in, in, in Jack uh, looking at cardiotoxicity of chemotherapy agents they're proposing going back to the method of Sarawitz and Lepeshkin using a tangent method and a Fredericia correction I can cover that at the end of the lecture if you wish but it's sort of fundamental blocking and tackling electrocardiography and I'm glad we're going back to that So back to the model system for, for QT prolongation and protecting our patients. The timeline again, Lou Cantalina, that article that I showed you. And then in the mid-2000s, universities, sponsors of drug drugs, and, and the FDA came together in an entity called the Cardiac Safety Research Consortium to bring us all together in a common framework in order to solve problems related to drug safety. In addition, and I'll show you in a second, uh, Ray Woosley uh, has, a, has now a website for QT prolongation. Hopefully I can convince you to download the app. And the, the Heart Association and the college have, have opined on prevention of torsade in the hospital. And I'll, I'll share a little bit about decision support for automating this process. This is the paper, if you wish to dig into this deeper, about prevention of torsade de Poin in hospital settings. Um, and uh, it is a, a very detailed discussion of the, of the topic. Again, uh, my colleagues will go through the stages of uh, denial and anger. Um, but So we studied in our, own, in our own health system in just a prospective way. We have a CCU that's, we have two 28-bed CCUs stacked on top of each other. And we just took a survey and about 900 patients admitted over, over that 11-month period. Fully 30% uh, of them had QT prolongation on admission and then almost 20% of them had QTs of over 500. Not necessarily a problem, these are sick people, but over a third of them continue to get drugs that further prolong their QT. We built a risk score and validated it for trying to prevent this and inform prescribers in the course of care because you can't remember all these medicines. We published this in circulation about four years ago. And there are now two, uh, two health systems in the country that I'm aware of that have automated this protection for patients from drug-induced proarrhythmia. Uh, one is the Mayo Clinic under the leadership of Dr. Mike Ackerman, and the other is IU Health. CredibleMeds.org for the trainees. This is the most authoritative source of information on QT prolonging drugs, so now you don't have to remember this. Uh, I would caution you that up to date is not up to date on this. This is maintained by experts and is available as a downloadable app for free and is the most authoritative and is actually now referenced in guidelines if you are it for, for the source of information on QT prolonging drugs and their potential risk for your patients. So what you'll see is over time from that initial case description of single women dying unexpectedly from a drug that shouldn't have had a cardiovascular effect, we now have automated systems, applications, and a consistent way of looking at these kinds of toxicities throughout the, the life cycle of the drug. So what do we do going forward? Personally, I believe that cardio-oncology is a huge challenge. Virtually every place that I go to now is, is very interested in this. People are identifying themselves as cardio-oncologists. And what an incredibly complex patient population. What a high-risk witch's brew of therapeutics. And what a huge volume of data to absorb. Um, I, I borrowed this slide from uh, Saparna Klassen, who came and, and, and gave a talk at IU. Um, I know this is just, these are just the immunotherapy trials in development. Each and every one of them with potential for off-target effects 
of these of these drugs. This, as I mentioned, there are organizations that bring people together. This is the website of the Cardiac Safety Research Consortium. This was founded uh, on a collaborative grant. Actually, the Duke Clinical Research Institute has been the academic driver of this, along with FDA and many individuals. And you can see that they, are, they have conducted a think tank specifically on the mitigation of cardiac safety signals in oncology drug development and some white papers will be coming out for those of you who are interested in the field. Uh, personally, with a group from, from of my former colleagues at Lilly, we've taken a, 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 a different approach to this um, in terms of being much more comprehensive. When you can engage a, a pharmaceutical manufacturer, um, one can get far, far upstream. So I've begun to argue around the country that our approach to cancer drug safety should be comprehensive and actually begin before the drugs are first given to man. And we published this, this takes a long lead time though. We had to go upstream of this, this particular chemotherapy uh, agent. It's not marketed, um, it's just an LY number. But before these, these patients were ever exposed to the drug, a comprehensive cardiac safety monitoring plan was put into place. And every patient participated. Biomarkers, structure function, electrophysiology, hemodynamics were all carefully monitored from every dose given in the development program. Measurements embedded all the way across the clinical trials timeline. Resulting in data that look like this, which can be a little bit hard to interpret, but this, if you just look at the BNP biomarker, every line is an individual patient in the development program. The lines truncate because these patients have cancer. But one can then begin to get a feel for whether or not there is any biomarker signal throughout the development by looking at each and every patient. The same for left ventricular function. This is monotherapy, this is a combination therapy that was also part of the initial protocol. And one can, rather than use a retrospective look, and have patients potentially harmed after drug release, one can identify signals much earlier in the development and try to prevent harm, which is what we are about. I mentioned diabetes. So we're now seeing five-year outcome studies on every new diabetes drugs. It's driving marketing, a lot of television ads, and direct-to-consumer marketing. But if you are wondering why that is happening in 2018, it's because of the story on rosaglitazone that I'm not going to go into, but many are aware that, that several anti-diabetic agents were withdrawn from the market for adverse cardiovascular outcomes, and that in 2008, just like the QT guidance that the FDA put out, they put out a guidance that mandated five-year cardiovascular safety trials for every new diabetes drug. And just, just a few days ago, the Endocrine and Metabolic Drugs Advisory Committee met it at FDA to discuss whether this approach was the optimal approach. It appears that there will be some tweaks to this approach, but we're going to continue to see cardiovascular outcomes trials in every new diabetes therapy. And with the gigantic uh, number of diabetes patients in the United States, I think this is going to be increasingly important. And this is my, the very first time I've referenced Twitter. Um, <laughs> But um, I have a Twitter handle for the folks, even at my age. Um, but um, actually, uh, the, the, the importance of this is, is you, no one with uh, less stature than Eugene Braunwald, uh, during uh, Chris O'Connor's uh, Innova heart failure uh, symposium a few weeks ago, um, 
Gene called for now a subspecialty of cardiology, of diabetic cardiology, and for specific cardiologists in each and every practice with additional training, and he was talking about six months of addi additional training in diabetes, um, specifically to address this increasingly linked and the increasing need for coordination of care for our diabetes patients. So for those of you who are looking for your niche in the world, uh, Gene says maybe you should look at diabetic cardiology. Let's switch to, let's switch to device safety, which has an, another uh, a, a different approach. Anybody recognize this? We don't know. We got one. We got one hand in the past. Okay, this is the uh, this is the Teletronics AccuFix J lead. Um, if you Google on Teletronics, you will find only the uh, Teletronics Foundation, which is the residual of what was then the second largest pacemaker company in the United States, and the and the foundation exists to uh, to pay the widows and orphans of patients who had um, this device. Um, so this is an explant of a, of, a, of a pacing lead. This is an atrial pacing lead uh, that at the time was, was uh, held in a J position for the atrium uh, to, to ease the insertion and the maintenance of, of capture of this device. And it was done so by a very, very uh, clever, uh, that's in quotes, uh, mechanism of welding a piece of spring steel to two points on the lead. And any welders? Welds break. And the resultant break released a, a, a piece of spring steel into the moving heart. And if some of the younger folks or some, some students or whatever have not been in, in, in the EP lab and watch the motion of a right atrial lead and how mobile it is, imagine a piece of spring steel in your right atrium. So, um, so how was this discovered? It was discovered by spontaneous reporting. It led to a recall. The company collapsed. Can we do better? The FDA thinks a lot about this, and I'm not going to go all, around, all the way around this wheel, but the, the FDA is, is thinking about, about comprehensive mechanisms for, for uh, device safety. This is not unique to cardiology. Certainly our orthopedic colleagues with metal-on-metal -metal hip prostheses um, uh, have, have suffered the same uh, slings and arrows. But if you want to sort of frame this, um, think about something simple. Think about bringing your rental car back to the airport. And a, 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 a Hertz technician with a handheld device will walk up to your car and instantaneously know your car and you and where you've been and, and check you in and check you out. Now think about a device recall in the United States and identifying through our electronic health records who has what and when it was implanted and what serial number it was. This is not rocket science. And one of the fundamental issues that, that we face in the United States now is this notion of having unique device identifiers. Shouldn't we know who has what and which one? And shouldn't that be relatively easy? So as I said, the old way was this. I think only a couple people in the, in the, um, in the audience had ever filed a med watch. But what if you? What if you encountered a device that you thought was defective? What would you do? And I've gotten the answers, you know, I'd call the rep, I'd do this, I'd do, you know, but many times these defective devices will wind up on the floor. And it is, it is easy, this is our duty as professionals, that if we see something to say something, but it's by no means a perfect system. So the plan is to do better. And the FDA, about now about eight years ago, uh, developed a comprehensive plan called a Sentinel Initiative. Um, but I'm going to show you a little bit of data from my friend uh, Fred Resnick uh, at Leahy, and I'm going to actually show you. So I want to give credit to Fred. Uh, these are these are his slides because he's much more expert in the device side than I am. But Fred always points out that. Safety of drugs, what I was talking about, is, is fundamentally different than the safety of devices. And he points out that while 
thousands and thousands of doses of drug may have gone in. In device trials, very few patients have been exposed to, to, to devices. In addition, um, there are variable requirements and uh, this unique device identifier, although it was mandated by Congress in 2015, uh, largely hasn't been a, a functioning uh, entity in our healthcare system. So Fred has taken the FDA's uh, uh, framework and has made some recommendations, but what he has really talked about is in the device area to have what he has termed active safety surveillance. We should know what happens all of the time. That should not be with a, with a small number of devices and our ability to track these electronically, to barcode these. Why don't we do this? And he points out that even though there is a spontaneous reporting system and the FDA receives a lot of reports, the number of reports that are, that are made are very small. There's no denominator information. And often, when people fill out MedWatch forms, they fill them out incompletely or inaccurately, and, and so the MedWatch mechanism for following and tracking devices is widely felt to be inadequate, although still an important piece of the puzzle. So what about active surveillance? Active surveillance is a little bit different than what, what Fred talks about. Um, but active surveillance uh, has been done in a number of areas. Actu this, is, this is the Center for uh, Device and Radiologic Health, so this is the device wing of the FDA. Um, they, try to, they try to be vigilant. Industry tries to be vigilant, but industry monitoring safety of devices is the traditional fox guarding the hen house. And, and, and academics um, uh, can, um, uh, can play a role in this as well. So in a true active surveillance system, it should be real time, it should be repeatable, and it should be methodologically appropriate. Fred has proposed a system of actually automated surveillance, meaning that we leverage our software tools in order to evaluate that we do this in real time when devices are implanted and we get this sort of flow, flow diagram. We go from something that is retrospective, a single study or a single patient, and we move over to something that operates in real time, is continuous and reliable. And along the way, we move from this single reporting, what I call a gotcha system, over to something that can actually identify. And let me show you how this might work. Let's take the, the Fidelis lead, and uh, here, are the, here are the real data. These are um, uh, data taken from, uh, from the Delta project, which is the project that Fred Resnick leads at the Leahy Clinic. And here is the Fidelis lead over time with its fracture rate. Uh, compared to a competitor lead already on the market. And at around 25 months of surveillance, by the traditional sense, we saw about a 3% failure rate of Fidelis opposed to a 0.1% failure rate of comparator. The voluntary recall of Fidelis occurred at 60 months leaving us a 35-month gap. And what does that translate into in terms of lives? That's about 70,000 lead implants that were performed during the potential identification of a signal and the voluntary recall. And there's 70,000 patients, or 70,000 people. So. I understand that in a, at, 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 at precisely 8.30 we will be stormed by medical students, so I wanted to leave some time for questions. So in the idea of safety first, what 
can I do? What can my system do to ensure safety? First of all, MedWatch isn't a bad thing. Spontaneous reporting, if done properly, accurately, timely, um, can identify signals. Lou Cantalina did. But also, I think, as a profession, we can support these independent safety organizations. We should not rely on industry to provide their own independent safety. The Cardiac Safety Research Consortium is an ideal forum. It brings academics, regulators, and industry together in, in common space to protect our patients. We got to do a better job of leveraging big data and real-time data. But finally, in an era of burnout and just I don't want one more thing to do, these safety systems really need to be practical and, and fit into your workflow. So it, it takes a tribe, it takes a village to do this, uh, but I think it requires uh, vigilance and focus. And in closing, um, I, I want to point out that we should work together. At the time of Lou's paper, there were six authors, six people that were passionate about this. And now we have organizations like the Cardiac Safety Research Consortium that bring together hundreds. But we need more. And so I'd like to open up to questions and I'll, uh, I'll show you my tribe. Um, a couple notables for people who don't know him. There's, there's Harvey Feigenbaum. Um, he's 85 years old, I think, uh, tomorrow. And he comes to work every day. Um, and uh, there's Doug Zipes, so uh, two, of, uh, two of our luminaries from the past at the Cranard Institute and, and uh, our very, very uh, wonderful, diverse group of fellows. This is our fellow graduation uh, last year and um, we hope that the, the, uh, the, the fellows are, are the leaders of the future and uh, I'll uh, entertain questions uh, from anybody who has any, so thank you. Free, go ahead. Great talk. Um, in the first part, uh, you focused a lot on uh, monitoring QT uh, after administration of birth. Can you comment about the current in vitro models? Because I mean, a lot of these drugs are tested in vitro, and there are some folks that have ideas about how to improve that. Can you comment about that? Uh, yeah, uh, so the, the question has to do, can, can, we do this, can we do this ahead of time with, with electrophysiologic assays? And um, part of the Cardiac Safety Research Consortium's effort is to take a, a variety of drugs and, and, and say, why do we ever put these in man? Can't we test these in patch clamp situations or whole cell currents and look at, 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 at what's, what's going on and, and eliminate those? And that is a very, very promising um, option for the future. There are a few exceptions to the rule. I pointed out um, uh, uh, arsenic trioxide. So arsenic trioxide, which affects channel trafficking and is a potent torsodigen, will not be caught by an, an, in, vitro, an in vitro or even an in silico assay to look at, 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 at cell currents. So there are some exceptions to the rule. And in addition, many of these problems, as we pointed out originally with terfenidine, are not a single drug, but they're drug-drug interactions or they're metabolic inhibitors. And so it would, be, it would be challenging, not necessarily impossible, to do this up front with electrophysiologic assays. That's work in progress. It will probably streamline the clinical work, but right now it's just an initial piece of the puzzle. That was a great talk. I was wondering if you could comment a little bit on how industry has really to change in their thinking on this. As you remember the whole guidance situation and the, the justification said, well, it didn't reach our, you know, our level for above the, the natural error rate that we actually see yep. and kept things on the market and people died. And do you think there's been a change in, in how industry is, is looking at this and looking at the <laughs> Is, is industry a partner? Uh, is industry an adversary? Um, is is always an interesting question, and I, I'm I'm a firm believer that that in general 
industry is working with us. They have the, the these are we have they have the best interest of the patients in mind. Um, they do not want to harm people, but they're, they're, re remember the incentives. It, it, there is an incentive not to have your product withdrawn. These are, these are major disasters. But I think the key is, are things like CSRC about bringing people together where there can be uh, many voices in the room, where the regulators are buffered by the academics and the industry people are held to, to, to task. Um, and, and I think the key is, is reliable data. Um, so the, in the past, you know, spontaneous reporting systems led to very, very dirty data. But if we move to, to a unique device, device identifier into having more real-time uh, monitoring of this, I think that industry is quite reasonable. But obviously, you know, stockholders don't want to see products trashed. Um, so it, there is a powerful incentive to the counter. Yes? A question, if you start creating a registry to look at device safety, that would also seem to allow you to look at device efficacy, both for primary and secondary prevention of ICD, yeah. in a way that's different from some post uh, implantation marketing. Is that part of the uh, device? Uh, registries are, are, are very important. Um, uh, the, you know, there have been federal mandates for registry participation. Uh, the ICD mandate is, is now coming off of the, of the NCDR, so you no longer have to register your ICD in order to get paid for it. Transcatheter aortic valve is another good example where registries play a role in continued monitoring of safety and efficacy. And I think that I think that verifiable registries with with quality and and and, and uh, data that can be verified are a real real important piece of this puzzle. Certainly, the the metal on metal hip, you know, if you're aware of that, you know that that whole issue was was an Australian registry of of uh, metal on metal hips showing the premature deterioration of those. So registries are, are, are very, very powerful for both safety and efficacy. Um, there is a natural resistance of industry to registering all of this stuff because then it's out there. Um, so we have to get a, you know, it's a cultural change in the country, the same that was alluded to. You know, can we work with, can we work with um, sponsors? And as a medical community, should we, should we insist that our sponsors take safety seriously, submit these data, use unique de device identifiers, help us embed them in our electronic medical records, and help us keep our patients safe? There's, there's plenty of business to go around, but let's not harm people. Yep. That was a really interesting talk, and it's really valuable to hear from some of you as experienced in the industry and, and um, outside of it as well. The, the, there's this political football about taxes on devices. Um, does that have any, if, was any of that money intended to improve the sort of systems that you're advocating for? Uh, uh, very perceptive. Very perceptive. The, um, uh, yes, there are two vehicles for this. Actually, the ACC um, went was one of the few uh, professional organizations that went when Padufa and Madufa were put up. So any, those words are nonsense to you guys. But <laughs> but Padufa, so, so Madufa is the Med Medical Device Users Fee Act. It is an act of Congress that specified that that there should be payments for systems of safety like this. Um, and there was an open testimony in front of, in, actually it was at the FDA, and Rob Califf, a cardiologist, was head of the FDA at the time. So, so very few people went to testify in favor of the Madufa and the Padufa Acts in order to appropriately fund the, the, the research that is behind safety. <laughs> And we were in favor of it. it. It was awarded. Obviously, the user's fee um, has been a political football. It's been up and down. Uh, I think currently it's off the table, if I, if I, I know that right, along with the death panels. Um, but but um, 
but we also can advocate for the science. And this is a corner of science that people think, well, you know, somebody, let, some, let, let somebody else do it. But it is a critical piece of science that needs to be done. And, uh, and, and for those of you who are looking, you know, some of the young people that are looking for your little niche in the world, this is, a, there, this is not a niche. I mean, this is, it, cardio-oncology now is like a gap. I mean, it's a huge gap in terms of, of how we're going to monitor all this stuff. And we, we need to get better at this. And, and even the systems that I propose are probably not viable in the age of where you're going to have thousands and thousands and thousands of therapies and thousands of combinations of therapies going into millions of patients. You're, somebody's really going to have to get smart with big data and understand how to detect signals. And, it, and whoever that is, whatever group that is, is going to be pretty famous. So, so just to follow up on that, one could argue that in addition to downloading the Ruthie's application and filling out those forms, we could vote for people who advocate for these monitoring systems. Uh, why shouldn't we be all telling our hospital systems, we need this information. We, we need it in real time. Um, and if one hospital system does this and another doesn't, whether it's QT, I use QT, but that's, that's the tip of the iceberg. But shame on us if we, if we don't follow these patients in a way that keeps them safe. And, uh, and, and our electronic health records should be part of this, and, and they don't do it now, at least mine doesn't. And I got Epic in one and Cerner in the other, and it, neither, of them, <laughs> neither of them are capable of doing this. Learn that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one foot in each canoe. Go ahead. Okay, I, I think we're on time for the medical students. Thank you very much.